So I won't have to tell you more about me. This morning we will be working on development psychology in the basics to understand behavior. When we understand why children behave in a certain way, that's part of the solution. Sorry, it, the system has changed the slide I was working with. Where is the mouse? Give me a moment, please. I'm used to a mouse, so... We will be concerned with developmental psychology and this afternoon we will talk about the typical development of behavior within families and in schools and how things can get to a point. Uh, this, minute, this afternoon I will take questions. Please come up with examples examples from your family life. So we can talk about those two. Don't wait until I'm done with my presentation, but just intervene. I would prefer that. Let me start with some basics. A mentally retarded person shouldn't be viewed as a clock whose movement is no longer in order. Instead, we should ask what language games can he play? That was a question put in 1946. It's about what can somebody do? And Wittgenstein talks about the importance of language is vital. The better somebody c can express himself, the less the risk of problematic behavior. That's, we see that importance of language here. When somebody is able to talk or use language, uh, if a person is not able to talk, use language, he will have to defend himself with hands, feet, and teeth. It took a long time before we had a um, seat for a uh, for the handicapped psychology in Deutsch in Germany. You see how development beha behavior can be a problem. Uh, you see a shy guy, and he always wanted to be the strongest. He often had tantrums. There is a clear uh, agreement between um, less communication and behavior. The better you can express yourself, the better you can develop. I'm not talking just about spoken language, but also about sign language. The better you can communicate, the better you can develop. So that should be stimulated. This is again a boy with ADHD, ADHD behavior who's fluttering through the sky. That's how he felt. I, when I started, I always thought people with a mental handicap behave as if they're handicapped. In psychiatry, people thought, they thought people with a mental handicap are retarded. Nowadays, we know that that is wrong. We know people get mental problems because of their handicap. For me, that was the deciding point. In essence, there is a clear connection, but there are clear differences 
Uh, handicapped people are not aliens. They are people like us with special difficulties. In essence, we're the same. You see, uh, the development of kids is normal. So there are therapeutical possibilities. And a disability is not an excuse for bad behavior. If it were an excuse, we would deny people with disability to the ability to learn. You can be asked to behave. Let me give an example. In schools for handicapped, the 15-year-olds will also get into puberty. <laughs> they will often be helped by teachers. Uh, they, 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 they grabbed the breast of the teacher, but who said, I don't want you to do that. So the teacher said, I know he might likes me, and I know, I've known him for a long time, and so I asked her, what would you do if he wasn't handicapped? I would put him in a corner. So I said, treat him normal. He's not... Uh, he, there is no special need here. In the next conversation, she told me that it happened again, and she told him at a loud voice, stop doing that. It took him some time to get to relax, but he stopped his behavior. And he saw that relation with the teacher remained normal. So the more normal you behave, the easier. There is a wrong attitude. Please avoid that. A boy will accompany us. A partial fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, when he was six, he painted, he draw, drew pictures like this. Both parents were alcoholics. They were divorced. Uh, the mother was stable after years of therapy. I will explain his development. This was a car he drew at six. So he was extreme in his uh, view of the world. Um, understanding behavior. The behavior of your child has sense. It's not meaningless. It's, uh, he's asking for treatment. An autistic kid will repeat certain tones, for example. That's self-regulation to try to get himself to relax. It's not meaningless behavior. It's always uh, an expression of the inability to express differently. Let me take an, an example of an autistic kid who will, would always lie down on the floor. And as teachers try to get him to relax, he would hit and bite the teachers. That was an aggression problem for her. But it was important to tell her that it was an expression of despair. The boy was desperate because it, everything was too much for him. You have to recognize the basics for the behavior. And when somebody can't talk and is in pain, how should he be, how should he communicate that? There's a nice story from Wilhelm Busch. A farmer had toothache 
and from the because of this pain he would hit his wife that is strange <laughs> so there is always a reason for behavior don't read this it's it's a whole list of uh, re reasons for uh, behavior a child with HDHD uh, who is acting up that may be a form of self-regulation for himself it's meaningful behavior because he can't stand uh, in action he needs action to feel better so that means that he will show problematic behavior it's often stimulation repeated movements that is why it's difficult to find the reason for the behavior behavior Let's take the example of HDHD. You were, you are often confronted with that, with those problems. If somebody has chaos in his head, that's not targeted behavior. It's he he he, he acts up to feel to better. So ch kids with HDHD who have difficulties in focusing uh, will act up. And, and you have to see a difference between normal kids and kids with those problems. For autistic kids are often self-regulating to relax. And they will act up to signal that they want to be left in peace. Let me get back to my examples. A hyperactive kid who acts up to get at the right level his solution will be a problem for everyone else. That is fatal. The kid is always rejected while he's doing something sens sensible for himself. Let me give you an example. A living group and there was a young woman with a slight mental disability. I was asked to come in because when the father would bring his daughter in, she would act up. And they didn't know what the reason was. They tried to find a reason. She was able to communicate, but everything that had to do with tension, she would refuse. She would always say, everything is all right. We talked with her and the parents. The father said, my wife has been chronically ill. And I'll, let me show you how it, what happened. So there was this father, the mother and daughter. And I will ask you to stand up so I can show you how they behaved. I want one person to take the role of the mother and one of the father. You don't have to do anything. Just stand here. As I said, you don't have to do anything. Yes, please stand here. As you see, 
please stand here and look at your parents. That's the parent level and the child level. The mother th said, I have to care for two kids. So the relation has shifted. So please stand next to the father. She said, sometimes my daughter acts like she's got control in the family. So the structure in the family was changed. Please come back. The structure in the family was mixed up. And that confused the daughter. And because the father didn't realize what the problem was, he couldn't help her solve it. No one in the family found security. And without talking about it, they, they couldn't find a solution. I asked the father, when you go out on Monday morning to school, is she complaining about belly ache? Yes, she does. So for me, that was a clear indication that there wasn't a, an aggression problem, but a anxiety problem. Please sit down. I'll t talk about this case more. It was an anxiety problem, something completely different. You did well. So it was an anxiety problem. So there is a disorder in kids, an emotional disorder, that can also be found in adults. That's not a normal uh, fear, but it's, it looks like a panic attack. It's a, the physical reaction is usually a bellyache. Many kids in basic school, uh, primary school age have anxiety problems, but people can't explain that. They just feel bad. So that's an anxiety problem. And what, what to do then? One idea was, as the father saw what the problem was, and the carers saw the problem, that already meant that people relaxed more. So we know what the problem is. So the situation got more relaxed. So the father had to convey security to his daughter. The mother couldn't because she was ill. The father always had to tell the f daughter who is who in the family. I'm the dad, she's the mom, you're the kid. Furthermore, he accompanied his behavior with speech. He told her everything he'd do. Let's go to your room. Let's get your bag. The father told his daughter, convey to his daughter, I know what we need to do. It sounds simple. But the problematic behavior lessened a lot. The trip to school would work positively. They would go to the bakery and have a small coffee before they went to school. The mother got more ill, and the father knew that he had to go home after dropping her off at school to help his daughter relax. She would stay on the floor for 10 minutes in the school, and the carers would know what was happening. That helped the daughter relax. The advantage was that the problem was diminished because they knew what the reason for the problem was. This too has to do with understanding behavior. What will what reaction does the kid ask for, get from me? 
it's not just emotional, you can get angry or something. What are my sensib sensibilities? A carer once told me he makes noises all day long. I'm, I'm, I'm getting crazy. Her colleague said, I don't hear it anymore. Everyone has his own problems. Uh, mother complained about the behavior during meals of her daughter. But who has the problem, the mother or the daughter? It would be best if both gave in some. They had to tell her daughter to uh, eat a bit better, but the mother had to be less sensible. But the daughter sh showed that behavior maybe to challenge her mother. Secondly, what does my reaction say about the problems of my kid? Let me give you an example. I need somebody to project, project on. You just have to sit here. Just as a something to project on. <laughs> the situation is this, an autistic boy in kindergarten who would lay on the floor in tantrums. The help said, I don't know whether I can take this anymore. He's over my limits. All the scratching and hitting is too much for me. And I have to, I, 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 I asked her to show what uh, reaction it got from her. Let me show you. Fictively, she had a dialogue with the kid. It wasn't a real discussion. I don't know whether I can continue working with you. It's too much for me. I don't know if I'm strong enough. I'm sometimes completely knackered. Sometimes I'm happy that you're not there. Those were the things she said, and those led for her to be able to work with the boy, just to express herself. That enabled her to continue working with him. If you put it on a table, you can look at it without it being only in your mind. There was a positive development because sometimes you can change stuff drastically. You can be very rude in, in your expressions, in your thoughts. But if you have those sort of thoughts, it doesn't mean you're a bad parent. Sometimes you just want to express your ideas about somebody. And you can say, it's too much for me. That's normal. It's nothing to do with love for your kid. Thank you. When somebody wants to try this, we can be do that, to have this dialogue. There's something that really annoys me. We can do this if you want to. And let me stress, if my kid has behavior that annoys me, how would that go for other people? Does it annoy them? How does it go, how, how, how's it, how is it for other kids? Is my reaction an expression of how others view my kid? It shows me what 
It can show me what my kid experiences. Um, kids are often rejected when they have uh, behavioral disability, uh, disorders. Kids often feel rejected and they will express themselves in even more problematic behavior. Another few uh, basics. There are no specific disorders, mental disorders, for handicapped people. That's important. But a handicap is a risk factor for development. It's a greater um, handicap people will show more aggressiveness and uh, stuff like that. But it's not senseless behavior. Let me talk about phenotypes for behavior. Let me in, in Jacobson syndrome, you see these things often, and those may be the result of the syndrome. But where is the line between behavior and the handicap? You can't find a line. They're intertwined. This, because of the genetic problem, this, be, this will uh, c um, be created. As, uh, there are different syndromes which will lead to self-mutilation, for example, and aggressive behavior. But only aggressive behaviors toward people with whom they have an emotional relationship. And if you're interested, we have this slide from our union who have special conventions. You can find these on the internet. It's about psychological disorders and stuff. You, uh, they will send you the presentations. Uh, we will send you these presentations so you can look at them. The diagnostic is can be problematic because of two phenomenons. Diagnostic overshadowing because the handicap Cap covers up the s mental disorder, like, for example, a, a, if somebody withdraws, that may be a sign of autism that while the person is not uh, autistic. So that will lead to the wrong diagnosis and the wrong treatment of people. And there is underreporting. People can not talk about what their problems are. And they can't tell you where somebody, something hurts. That is a problem. That makes the diagnosis difficult. You need a doctor who knows about this and who recognizes these problems. Not everything that is repeated is stereotypic. It's quite difficult to diagnose ADHD. Uh, uh, 
a doctor can't say after half an hour the kid has HDHD. That's he needs more information from the parents, from uh, educators. So it's fairly labour intensive. I had to do a lot with the HDHD problematics. It's important to say that it's a real behave, a, a development disorder. You have to be very careful about it. When somebody says a kid has HEHD, that will already lead to problems. That's the same. You, to say a kid has a broken arm, that's an objective uh, diagnosis, but HEHD can't be an objective diagnosis. You have to be clear about that, it's not a fact. We've concluded that if some criteria are met, there will be a HEHD diagnosis. This is a girl with HEHD. She felt like she always floated and dreamed, dreamt. So she clearly had attention problems. That was the big problem. Earlier, they called it hyperactivity, but the problem was an attention deficit. Back to the boy. He allowed me to show this. He always gave me pictures. Here he was six years, and he drew people. This is a drawing of a home and his room. You see, he has developed slightly, and I always encouraged him to express himself. He was able to express himself like this. Are there any questions for now? To know what the problem is, it leads to the question, what does a kid need? That's why you have to know what, it, what the problem is. The, deny, uh, the diagnosis should lead to uh, treatment uh, ideas. A good handling of the case leads to insights into what needs to be done. That's why it's important. That's why you need good relations with doctors to have a good diagnosis. We will go to into some points that need your attention. Let's talk about self-regulation. Most of you, uh, most of your kids will have problems in self-regulation. It's difficult to learn. Communication and speech, social cognition, and cognitive development. We will go into those. 
from a development psychological, uh, psychological perspective. These are also important development um, themes. Let's go into self-regulation. You need to learn to control yourself, to control your behavior and your emotions. It's, we are able, when the emotions aren't too strong, to regulate them. But those are processes your kids have to learn. Impulse control, no, not only to react impulsively. It's also about frustration and self-development. If I can hold my own in a situation, I will feel stronger. And that will give me more uh, I can only develop inner strength when I can resolve problems myself without avoiding them. Uh, this is an example of a boy. I learned, I got to know him when he was in kindergarten. He would have tantrums and would hit people. He would really be beside himself. When I got to know him, he already knew that he hurt himself because nobody would like to play with him. Uh, and the question was, do you decide that you go into a tantrum? And he said, I want to be able to regulate that myself. So we, I worked with him. How do you react when you're provoked, when others joke about you? So he learned that there wasn't one solution, but there was also uh, there were also different reactions. He always felt attacked, so he couldn't make differentiate who does like me, who doesn't. So that's a typical behavior in. Uh, aggressive uh, behavior, you always see f enemies around you. He hit me because he thought I looked differently at him. So the kid always feels justified in his aggressive behavior. And if the be behavior is uh, punished, the child fel feels uh, more convinced that everyone, the whole world, is against him. So when he got into school, he would still show this behavior, but he wrote to me that he wanted to get rid of that behavior as well. Back to tantrums, it's important that if you have a kid who is shows tantrums or aggressive behavior. If a kid re uh, relaxes, you have to stimulate it positively. When, when the kid comes to you after a conflict to see whether you still like your kid, you need to affirm the kid and say, it's good that you Relax. That's that's confirmation of good behavior. We think too much like adults. The kid has relaxed, and we have to talk about it. But the kid feels attacked then. You have to show the kid that it's good that it relaxed. Kids should learn to relax quicker. We think too much like, much like adults. A classic psychologi psychological experiment, the marshmallow test. An Austrian who uh, fled for the Nazis to 
the U.S. Um, the classic experiment is the researcher puts a marshmallow on the table, has to go out and says, if it's still there when I come back, there will be two marshmallows for you. Uh, and the older kids get, the more they are able to restrain themselves. Uh, how difficult it is, you, uh, I have a link to a video where you can see how difficult it is for kids to restrain themselves. That's what we, we, we see that in ourselves as well. Uh, partners can restrain you from doing things. So uh, for kids, it's difficult to learn to wait. It, it's, they don't learn that from themselves. They have to be taught that. And they l learn it from conflicts and stuff like that. That's important. Research has shown a connection between um, the ability to restrain yourself and problematic behavior. The behavior uh, lessens. Kids are able to stay more relaxed because they didn't don't take everything personally. Everyone has to learn how to regulate his behavior. When a kid is born, it has limited skills to regulate themselves. The parents have to soothe the kid. And kids learn over time how to do that themselves. They are able to relax more. But kids with cognitive problems have a lot more problems to learn this. To be able to wait means I can suffer through the inner battle. This was a drawing from, of the boy about his father. He didn't want to talk about his father. What do you see here? This, was, uh, this is a drawing from a kid, six years and eight months old. He's in the machine, and on the left, you see the father. He's in the water cannon and fires at his father. He's drawn himself as a crippled kid. And up there you see a phallic symbol, a penis. And he often drew also um, a, in, in kindergarten there were already uh, there was a question whether there was uh, uh, sexual molest but there wasn't but in school for example you have kids who who uh, try to who can piss the furthest it remembered it reminded this reminded me of that here he drew himself as somebody who can lift up a car he wanted to be strong like this They were living in a small village as where he would meet his father even every now and then. The father would always threaten the mother while the kid was next to him, uh, powerless. That's why he drew this picture. The boy never talked about his father, but the mother told, t mother told me about his uh, about this, and that's why he was so aggressive in kindergarten. But we saw a positive development, but the father was taboo. Here he draw his home at seven. 
it seems to show limited development. <laughs> Am I doing okay? So self-regulation? You can't expect from a kid that's two years old that it can wait. It needs to be old enough to be able to do that. So hand, uh, action planning, targeted behavior, to be able to organize, why is that important? When I'm in a fight with somebody, what do I have to do to get on equal terms? For us, that behavior is easy. I'm not going to hit you because I don't want to be in a fight. That's simple behavior for us. If a kid shows untargeted behavior, when you see a kid playing with Lego and that builds something, and you see other kids who are just playing around, that's a, a, a skill you have to learn. This is the uh, room of my daughter. We had a few rules. We would clean up together, and we didn't want any mildew anywhere. Those were our rules. Simple plans on doing one thing after another. Let me give you an example of planning. This is about comparing. The top is the example. One of these bears is exactly the same as the one on top. Try to solve this problem and try to see what you are doing. Could somebody tell me how they're acting? I, I just want to know how you are, uh, what, what you're using, what method you are using. What do you compare? What do you compare? Things that uh, you, you compare deta details. You take one th single point and you try and compare them with all the others. Yes. I first look at the whole picture. Which picture looks more identical? That's a, an action strategy, targeted behavior, and, uh, and an exclusion strategy. So you can also say, I will only compare the hairs, and so that eliminates a few. That's another strategy. Such a simple plan will lead to the solution, but I need a plan. I must have been taught how to act. Kids in school will be told. Um, you don't have to repeat. You can't repeat stuff with kids. You have to l first learn them how to learn. You can try and teach kids how to write, but you need a special form to do that. It's like observation training first. This is very 
helpful to show action planning. There are also games that use this. The kids needs, need an action plan to be able to uh, solve situations. This sounds complicated, more complicated than it is. Cognition and metacognition, it's nothing special. Cognition is awareness, and the extreme form is during uh, problem solving, you think, am I doing right? That's only for humans. Or what did I do wrong? That is an over complicated form. You're thinking about what you're doing at that point. That is metacognition. I need that to be able to learn from mistakes. And thinking about yourself. Kids that grow older are starting to think about their own limitations. I need these the, the skill to be able to think about yourself. That's the extreme form. The more you get a kid to think, the better it is. They have to think. It is important to look, for example, with a game like this. Do this with your kid to see how does it, what strategy does it use? Does it have a plan or just do things willy-nilly? So that's cognition and metacognition. Let me show you why you need this. Action planning and that thinking is needed. It helps you to develop the skill to meet friends. For us, that's simple. That's automatic for us. We don't think about that. It just works. If you're at a party, you're next to somebody you don't know. You aren't thinking about what you're going to do, but you have your own style. You just talk to somebody because you have your own style to do that. What do I have to do too? Those are all things that are part of that cognition and metacognition. It's not extremely complex. It can be very thim simple things. That's what I train with kids, for example. With it, this Solving this seems difficult, but let me show you how I do it. And I'll solve the problem thinking aloud. First I look at this, and then I do this and that. I'm the role model for a kid. And we practice this in therapy. We continuously practice this so they learn how to solve problems like this. We, we teach them problem solving with exercises like this. You just need to practice, practice, practice. Next is social understanding. This is uh, these this series of pictures in the, is in the wrong uh, order. What is the right order? You think?
We start with number two. Do we agree? And then? What is the next picture? Number four. First this, then this, then number one, and th the third. Mr. Jakob is always helpful. How would you describe this story? Please tell me the story. Yes, little Mr. Jakob. Please tell me the story. What is the meaning of this story? What is it about? Mr. Jakob is on his duck and goes into the reed, and then small ducks chase him. Their mother comes and gets the little ducks back and made the gummy, the, the plastic ducks sink. Do we agree on this story? He comes back out with the ducklings behind him and the mother saves her ducklings and makes Mr. Jacob sink. How do we know she is the mother? Why do we all think she's the mother? Why not the father? Yes. We see this story, all the, we all see the story the same, so we understand each other, we think alike. And that's why we can understand each other. We all say it must be the mother. So we give the story a, a human meaning. We humify this, no, we make the story more human, and that's why we can agree on the story. But if you have a kid who sees it differently, who doesn't see the same meaning, it's very difficult to come to agreements. Think about autism, autistic Kin, ch 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 uh, artistic child children see the stories, the pictures individually, and they can't agree on the right order of the story because they don't understand the order. How do I communicate with someone who lives in a different world than me? That makes the contact more difficult. That's, we call it central coherence, to all agree on the same story. When small kids tell you a story, they talk about details because they can't understand the essence, really. When children draw something, they only draw, they details. Others will paint a big picture. That's the difference. There are nowadays boxes with stories like this. To do this yourself. On the internet you can find stories like this. For kids it is, this is, can be very difficult. So it's about social understanding. We interpret, constantly interpret the behavior of others. I don't, we are continuously uh, thinking about people and that's why we can agree. How do things, uh, how, how is it that you can within seconds think somebody is nice or not. How does that work? It's difficult to distance yourself from that. When you think somebody is unsympathetic, it's difficult to think 
Oh, he, in reality, he's quite all right. Can I read between lines? That's important. You have you have to explain to your autistic people that you don't have to uh, take everything literally. To recognize somebody's motives and feelings. How do we recognize somebody's mood when you look at someone? You have to develop that ability, that skill. You develop it more when there's a lot of discussion in families about feelings. And in autistic children, we talk about theory of mind. That's their problem, to read the emotions from someone's face. That's a problem for them. Autism is often found as a problem in Jakobsen. Do you recognize that? Is that somebody you experience personally? Autistic f features or real autism? We have our theory about how people function. And that's why we get along. It's not automatic that kids experience it. It's the same. So that makes understanding difficult. All over the world, these kids learn how to recognize feelings in kids between three and five. For kids who are handicapped, that takes more time. Okay. On to the theme of communication. To be able to express yourself. Understand how others express themselves. This is how a boy expressed himself. He always drew like this. He's under machine. He's powerless. He couldn't express, explain more. His mother told me he was operated on often as a kid. He couldn't express himself about that in speech because he couldn't speak yet but he could do, draw it. That was his way to express himself. So communication. Let me give you an example. From a daycare center, a five-year-old aggressive boy, uh, they asked the parents to come in because they were worried. They greeted the parents and they started to talk and the father said, I studied, I, I, I had went to college and how were you educated? A strange uh, way to communicate. Are you asking for information or is the man expressing I'm um, better than you. The problem was the father experienced a lot of problems. He wasn't a bad father, but because of all the problems, he, uh, pressure, he wanted to express um, that I'm in control here. 
there are always two levels in communication, always a factual level and a relationship level. And the level, the relationship level is most important. Are you on the same eye level? The mother gives a, uh, a book to the educator uh, on um, education. Is that a recognition of your capabilities. The mother gave the book because she had read, read it and thought it was important for the educator to read it. There's always a relationship aspect, and that's very relevant. When you agree and have a good relationship, you can talk about more things. If you don't have a good relationship, there will be endless discussions. Uh, if the problem is not on the level of a relationship, partners can have and endless discussions. That's crucial. Every form of communication involves the relationship level. Is there a dominant person? Is uh, All of that is on the relationship level. So please be mindful of that. And then there's the difference between relationship and the act actual situation. Kids think if if I'm angry with mom, I don't like her, and if I'm nice to her, I like her. The kids have to learn to differentiate. Even if mom is angry, she still loves me. So it's possible to have conflicting feelings. If you learn that, you don't take everything personally. If I don't learn that, I take everything personally. Probably you, you have a friend who takes everything literal, and you are mindful of that. So please make a conscience, differentiate consciously between the two. Kids have to learn to differentiate between the relationship and the actual situation. It's important to be mindful of that. Does a kid understand they, the two are different? So we have communication and meta-communication. Communication might mean a fight on the one level. While the other is like he is, we have a problem. That's that level. Meta-communication means, can we talk about how we relate to each other? That's a different level. Why do we always have a fights? You have to wonder. Why do you relax, uh, relate? Uh, why do you react always the same when I ask you to do s stuff? When you're able to be to communicate on the same level, you can solve the problem. If you have a colleague in work. who's been grumpy to you. You think, does he have a problem with me? That's a relationship theme. You can talk about that. 
you can ask, uh, do you have a problem with me? And if the other says, yes, uh, I'm angry because of Elips, or he can not react. But you need to communicate on this level to be able to solve problems. When you disagree about basic things, you have to resolve them on this level. How can we work together despite differing attitude? Then the different attitudes you have will become the specific content. When a child is born with cognitive limitations, the stress in parents will grow, and that will have influ that will influence the relationship. And then, parents will have to be able to communicate about the difficult situation. That you need a an exchange of. Uh, ideas. Why do you always uh, yell at me? I don't yell. That's a direct level. You, you, you hear it when people say always or never. Why do you always? It's often, parents often forget to, to care about themselves and about this communication, but it's very important. How do we agree, agree with each other in difficult situations? When we talk about the education of our kid, our raising our kid. Relationships, conflict on this level leads to um, problems. For example, in working groups, if in, in, in work, if there is one small problem, the whole mood uh, gets worse. That's the problem. Relationships are often the problem at the root of the problem. and have to wonder, why do we fight so much? That's about communication. These are all examples of this level. You have to talk about problems. About small kids from Newborns to three years old. Uh, Crybabies, for example, or kids with uh, d uh, sleeping or eating disorder. We would offer people support. We try to help parents. And because at this age, that's very easy, relatively easy. Kids with development risks are more prone to have a disorder. Kids are, that cry a lot, and in cry babies you have the three times three times three. Those crybabies are kids who, for three weeks, at least three days a week, at least three hours a day, they cry. Crybabies cry for 15 to 16 hours a day sometimes.
those kids will always cry when they reach their limits. Is somebody here with a small kid? How do you experience how um, your how quickly your kid kid gets out of balance? How much does it take to uh, relax and make your kid relax? My younger daughter in the first few months slept badly. I took her on my arm and would walk around. And then I would put her down. But she would start to cry again. And when I started working with this, I saw I was too active. I would stimulate the kid by walking around with it might have been better just to have some physical contact and sit next to her. Kids feel how you feel. You know that three months colics are usually colics. They will lead to stress in families. And a crybaby cannot handle stress. And that's for people, is that a big problem? It's nothing to do with the emotional relationship. So I finished the treatment of the guy. I asked him to draw his family and animals. He was the dog, mum the cat, and the granddad was the lion. And who's the con in the important, most important person in the family? Gran was the lion. She would decide everything. Mama had to work a lot. And the grandmother would care for the kid. The strong people in the family were the women. The men needed help. Dad was an alcoholic. There wasn't. A male person who helped the kid. The kid was always aggressive in school and developed well. At first I thought he has a really big problem. Also because the mum couldn't really help. The kid developed well, but he drew a line here and drew a cross that represents his father. He didn't want to talk about his father at all. But still, he, he grew. The treatment took at least two years. Two years later, I heard from him again. And he drew pictures like this. He kills his father. You see blood. And he's happy. I'm glad he's dead, the bastard. The teacher uh, got scared. I mean, will he be a mass murderer later? She talked to the mother, and she wanted to talk with the mother and with the boy and with me. And he could talk about his father. I saw that he wasn't physically aggressive because he was able to express himself like this. It would have been wrong to prohibit him from doing this. This is a form of 
being able to express himself to relieve himself of some pressure. I asked the mother to watch pictures with the boy of parents who had a loving relationship where the father wasn't a monster. monster. The final picture I got shows again how he kills his father. But he, he drew with colors. This is the last picture he sent me. It's clear the situation would remain the same because the father would still threaten the mother. For me, it was clear I shouldn't make excuses for the father and I should accept that the boy expressed himself like this. The development in this phase, you, s you, you develop a concept of self. How do I see myself? How do I like myself? Do I see myself as somebody who's handicapped or as somebody who can do things? Within the first four or five years, um, you develop that. Do I think I can do things or do I think I'm powerless? It's important for kids to experience a lot that they solve problems to develop a self-image that they are capable of doing things. So that's why it's good to sometimes ask too much of a kid. A boy wants to lose the side wheels to his bike. But as soon as he's got a regular bike, he starts falling. And if the father then says, let's go to a safe place and just practice, in that case, the father shows the boy to persevere. Never give up, keep trying. It's important to know that you can do things. If you feel helpless, that's bad. If a kid cries and you can't do anything, that's hellish. In panic attacks, you feel helpless. I'm helpless. I can't do anything. You don't fear death, but you feel helpless. Kids with cognitive problems often feel helpless. When in medical situations, they feel helpless. It's important to know what can my kid do? How do I help my kid to feel in control? It's important to make them feel in control. This is a developmental psychology experiment with uh, kids who are eight weeks old. We see three different perpetual mobiles. <laughs> These are all kids of eight weeks old. They tried to see how kids were interested and how would they move their heads. With the normal mobile, uh, the, 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 the interest would diminish. If it moved, there would be some interest, but if the mobile really moved, the kid would be very much interested and that without a clear understanding of the situation. It's not 
conscious of the fact that moving its head would move the mobile. So it wasn't conscious, but it still noticed I am accomplishing something, I'm making the mobile move. Uh, I feel strong and I can accomplish things. It's important that kids feel that. Kids feel their own strength. They feel meaning. That's the experience of their own influence. In the 60s, in the US, they researched this. They trained rats with electric power. Some of the rats experienced helplessness. And they tried to see how long those rats would stay afloat in a tank. Those that felt empowered would stay up longer. The f those that felt helpless um, would go under earlier. So helplessness can be learned. If you always experience helplessness, that will be integrated in your personality. Kids will always do the same thing until they learn something else. Repetitive behavior. In repetitive behavior, they can experience what they can do themselves. About psychotherapy. Here they do psychotherapy for people with a mental handicap. People can use therapy sometimes. Uh, you can search, you can get help uh, from I'm sorry. Kids with mental disabilities uh, will need special care in, in uh, uh, education. There are people who can help you with this. He's talking about an example of uh, an educator who tried to help people, but I've lost the story, to be honest. <laughs> Difficult behavior can challenge people, and you need support then. And you can find it here. I worked in a group. And they have a sibling group there. Siblings meet here to talk about their feelings, about f their feelings when they have uh, a, a mentally disabled sibling. I don't need to say anything. You can read it yourself. Good. OK.
these are some themes. You can read here what they mean. These are official criteria for HDHD. Uh, small attention span. If you score a clear, if you clearly score on six out of nine, you will have HDHD, and you have to score six of these to be hyperactive and impulsive. When you have a kid who only make, has problems in school and not at home, he will probably have HEHD. There are also adult children here. The criteria for adults are similar, but aggressive development is secondary. It's not an original HEHD problem, but it's a result of bad experiences with other people. That's why they often get more aggressive. If a kid is ag aggressive for a long time, it needs treatment. So if a kid shows aggressive behavior, it is good to seek help because the longer it lasts, the more it, feel, it, it, it gets confirmed and that the diagnosis in that case is bad. When do kids develop a fear of witches and monsters, do you think? Four years old? Yes. When kids start to express fear for figures like that, it means that their mental development is far enough. It's a sign of good development. When can kids lie convincingly? Convincingly. Or give convincing excuses. Between six and seven, usually. Only then they can uh, re re replace themselves, th th they can get into somebody else's mind and you learn to lie convincingly. It's a sign, a sign of social uh, skill, a social skill. Short, uh, let me talk about autism. Maybe someone has an example of a kid with autistic features. Or a kid that has breakthroughs every once in a while. There is, you can talk about meltdowns when kids lose control and how about tantrums? I mean, you are confronted with tantrums every now and then, are you? Let me do this with you. Why are tantrums a problem?
let's take a, an emotional curve concerning an extreme anger attack, tantrum. Some kids go from zero to 100 in a short time. Others take more time. So this is the escalation phase. Here they are, you can communicate with them. This is the soothing or phase or when they're just tired. Here they are also responsive. But there, this is the limit where you l just lose control. That may feel painful because you feel that you've gone too far. Here is a total loss of control. In this phase, you only have damage, damage limitation. You can't stop them. You just have to take care that nothing happens to them. The brain has just switched off in this phase. Let's take a youngster, a teenager. They're not concerned about themselves anymore. That's why they're so extremely powerful. They don't care about hurting themselves. In this situation, they are always very strong. But this is so demanding that kids will grow tired or Uh, in, in, in a situation, there was a kid who would just flip out completely, and educators would keep their distance. But that, there's two emergency solutions. The first is a change of uh, person. It shouldn't be somebody, it doesn't have to be somebody with a close relation with the kid. You can tell your partner, please take over. And a change of location can also help, if possible. I can't stop the tantrum, but I can change the circumstances in which it happens with whom and where. After some time, it helps the kid because they experience that as a form of security. The adult knows what to do when I'm helpless. You can't stop the tantrum itself. To try and soothe the kid here, will only increase the problem. When you come home and you're stressed out, you don't need a partner to try and communicate. You first need to calm down for yourself to be able to communicate. So when you approach a kid here, the tantrum might grow. 
in daycare centers or schools where other kids are involved and where you have to be careful that nothing happens to them. Uh, to to in a school where I was, there was a man who would just let himself fall on someone else in cases of a tantrum. But they would find somebody to take the man to a different location. They agreed with the guy, when you get into a tantrum, we will take you somewhere else. And the kid, it was a gym teacher who would help them. And, 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 and that's an emergent situation. So to survive this tantrum, And a kid with autism in a tantrum situation, they are incredibly strong. They switch off. And that's what's so difficult about this situation. Anyone, any question or an example, please come up with <laughs> with examples. You've been confronted with so many challenges. Or please tell us what helped. What is the best way for you to solve this during a tantrum? OK. I'll give you a few more examples. Now I have two microphones. So we had the autistic boy who would lie on the floor and hit the floor. The first step was to see it was desperation. He got in this situation because everything was became too much. It helped to know that it was desperation and not aggression. And the next step was to create a safe haven for the boy, a quiet corner. Uh, the help would go into that corner with him. Uh, at first, not in stress situation, just for him to realize that that was his quiet corner. That drastically reduced the anger attacks, the tantrums. The next step was she noticed, let's go to the place when I feel the tension is rising. The target was for him to be able to go to the corner when he felt stressed. But then Corona came. The kid got really ill and was absent for a long time. And after he returned, the situation was a lot worse than because of all the changes. And they took, started again with the safe haven. And after a few days, he said his first word. He said, orange. The help knew he likes orange juice. And she gave him some orange juice. Before, he would always pull adults to the kitchen. The next step was 
that he went to the educator. He would still be aggressive towards indicators, but not to the help. And the next phase was that he watched the garden where people were working. And he, then he said, no garden. And that, for him, gave him more peace. So that was the first time he used speech to find more peace. And I was in a daycare center to observe. And I saw a kid who would always go to a special place. And if he was drawn from that, he would become aggressive. So I said, if she needs to go to her table, don't change that. But try and change the setting. Give her a special table to withdraw to. After That worked after a short while. So we were able to influence her behavior. I can sit at a table, but only that specific table. So that would mean that she would go below the tables less often. So they wouldn't draw her from under a table because she would be more at peace at her special table. So they were able to offer her something for her mental stability. But you first have to develop that alternative. When I've only learned to hit people when I'm provoked, uh, you need to develop an alternative first. You can't stop behavior until you offer an alternative. I can't take something from a person that the person needs. I first need to find an alternative. So the boy stopped, stopped hitting people, but used a different solution. That was a step forward. He went from physical aggressiveness to verbal aggressiveness. That was a development. When I just have one solution, I will always use that one solution. Uh, sometimes kids can see aggressive behavior as a positive solution, and they feel justified. Try to offer an alternative. about the division in autism. Most of the autistic people have a strong mental handicap. Most have a big handicap. But with their special skills, You have uh, re s autistic, autos, autistic savant, as, but there's only 80 in the world. Uh, you see autistic features everywhere. Are there any questions? Or do you have anything to offer? Let's see. Um, I had a question especially related to the 
HDAHS, so the um, attention deficit. Um, many of the characteristics you showed uh, were familiar to me, or at least to my daughter, uh, what I see. Um, and I was wondering what kind of treatment can you do there? And I'm a bit afraid that many of the doctors, if we do reach out to therapists to ask for some therapy, therapy that they'll quickly reach to a medication. Um, so I was wondering what alternatives uh, are available and why would you How do we treat HDHS? And do we use medication officially? Will pediatric doctors only when they treat kids just with medication? That's a, a, a mistake. They also need therapy, but those places are difficult to find. If you treat HDHS problems, the first pillar is parental education. So support of the parents and psychologists always devise strange terms for that. <coughs> By now we know this is very important. There's a difference between seeing um, they are very involved or not. That's important. And then therapy with the kids is very important as well. That's to practice certain actions, to find structure. How do I react in conflicts, etc.? Optimum would be group therapy. So your kid learns to handle, to deal with conflict in a group. How do you, this is the ideal case. Often you can, should just be happy to have these two. This is very a treatment that's really pedagogical. Uh, they want kids to accompany their own behavior verbally. I will always tell the kid what I'm doing, and I show it as well. When I have, I'm in a fight with somebody, I will clearly say what I'm doing. That will show the, the, the that will make the therapist a example for the kid to show him about what should I do to get a, to make friends or something that's just practice 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 it's very involved and very fatiguing but there is and the problem is there is no transfer kids learn something but they can't teach the same behavior to others when they've learned to use a lexicon, they will no, uh, learn how to use a dictionary. 
That what makes it very fatiguing. And number four is medication. Uh, in Germany, more and more medication is prescribed. From kilos, it went to tons. But medication requires a clear diagnosis. That's a condition for medicating kids. So there is therapy, and you use medication to uh, prevent extreme conditions. When there is a clear diagnosis, you can maybe use medication. For example, Ritalin. <laughs> the <laughs> inventor named it after his wife, Rita. There are also antidepressants that have side effects. Um, these activate um, parts of the brain that help a kind get more relaxed. These only help when parents really can't deal with problems. There has to be control, monitoring. Sometimes smaller doses work better, and you don't want an apathic kid. That's uninterested in everything. Not every kid with this diagnosis can profit from medication. There are also placebos that may help. You have to be critical, but you, I don't exclude medication, and it has to be monitored. There must be trials where they are not using it. If the kid goes to school, you can agree with the doctor to stop medicating a kid for a week without the school knowing. If the school then says, What's wrong with the kid? You know the medication works. When you stop using it for a week, um, we're telling the school, uh, the teachers will know and will have preconceived notions. So there has to be monitoring. And for medication, you don't need a level, like for example with antidepressants, you can leave them out for a week. You don't have, you, you don't need a, a specific level continuously. If you use medication like Ritalin, they have limited working. Uh, my son? For my son, Ritalin doesn't work. He will get sick. He now uses his and to weave. Do you know it? What is the indication? The new medicine works great. Because he got sick by Ritalin, 
he now uses into Neve. You don't know it? It is for HD HS. Why do he, does he get the med, the medication? Because nothing else helped. He was always sick. Yeah. We have to find out why does he get sick? Was the original medication the problem or is there a different problem? Some psychological problems will have physical uh, effects. Bellyache always points to mental problems, to anxiety. Kids will stress, and so they will get belly aches, inexplicable belly aches. If you don't find the reason for something, you might do the wrong thing by using just medication. You have to find, find out, does a medication work? kids who use Ritalin for a long time will have a long-term improvement. Ritalin isn't a, a miracle cure. They thought insulin would help people uh, mentally. That was wrong. Kids who are diagnosed with HDS uh, will sometimes have something else. So you have to be al always monitor the situation before you change medication. I once had a uh, athlete I treated he had to take this medication, which is difficult when you're a top athlete. But that was necessary. It can be useful to use medication. Some kids react very well to them. But we talked about self-image. For the kid, it means I'm better because I use medication, not because I can do it myself. It is important that a kid sees it can do things, can do thing, things themselves, itself, and that the medication just helps. There is a difference between saying I solved it myself or I was helped. You can either view things negatively or positively. That's the danger. Our kids think um, I'm doing better because I'm using medication, not because I'm doing it myself. Anything else? Maybe it was a bit much. Hi, uh, my daughter was um, diagnosed with ADD as well as uh, JS. Uh, we tried medication, Medicinet. Um, we've done it twice. Um, and it, it really hasn't worked for her. Uh, made her very mm. angry, frustrated, and completely stopped eating. Um, and steps one and two, you speak about therapy and three groups. My question, uh, in the UK, we went to like a paediatrician, he diagnosed her, 
gave her medication straight away. D never got offered any therapy. Mm. W how do you get the therapy or where or yeah, that's my question. If that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Also, die Nebenwirkung von Ritalin oder Medikinet kann sein äh, Appetitverlust, ist eine Nebenwirkung. Und eben, ab, äh, dass die Kinder apathisch sind, gereizt sind, schlecht drauf sind. Und dann eben auch, dass die Kinder schlecht drauf sind und dann gereizt sind. Ja, das kann eine Nebenwirkung sein. Und da muss man sich darauf achten, wenn man diese Nebenwirkungen hat, ob das sinnvoll ist, das Mittel weiter zu verordnen. Also es geht nicht darum zu sagen, das vollständig auszuschließen, aber man muss darauf achten und der Arzt muss das begleiten. Auch, äh Ach, hören Sie, hören Sie nicht. Sorry, I forgot to... <lacht> um, können Sie noch mal beginnen, denn... Ja, ich hatte abgeschaltet. <laughs> uh, loss of appetite can be a side effect and apathy as well. The kid feels, feels bad and it gets aggressive. That can be a side effect. And then that means that you have to consider stopping using medication. But any Ritalin like medication that flows into the blood slowly and that might work better but first you need a doctor who knows really knows his medications if the results are negative you have to stop but again you have the situation that often they use just medication and no therapy because there's not enough therapists. There are special uh, training for therapists. But that's really bothersome. Uh, even in Germany we have a problem with therapy. The best behavioral, best solution is behavioral therapy. Um, the offer of behavioral therapy. There are many therapists who, who, who trained more, especially for HESD, but there's not enough places for patients. I don't know how that is in the UK. There are therapists, but not enough probably. My point is that medication won't teach kids anything. It has to be done here. You have to support parents and you have to give therapy. You have to teach kids how to allow for their limitations. Medication won't teach them anything when medication helps. That it might make kids more focused, but that has to be monitored by doctors. Is there a positive effect? Because there are uh, medications that are very uh, powerful. A colleague of mine once used a special uh, medication as a stimulant. The, 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 there is no reason to think kids will get addicted to uh, a medication like this, but you have to be careful about using them. Is that an answer to your question? Great.
It's the same. Um, the patent for uh, Ritalin has finished, so Medicanet is the same. There is a difference between medications. Some work only for four hours, or there are medications that work longer. But the problem is they are prescribed too often. And that what is important doesn't happen. These two are extremely important, and especially this one. You have to support the parents about how to deal with a kid. and how you start certain developments. That's what they learn. And when, you, uh, when a doctor prescribes medication, you won't be able to, to uh, have a lot of discussion about the therapy. This afternoon, we'll talk about this more. Kids with HES S aren't aggressive. It's a secondary problem. It's an addition. It's an extra development, that aggressiveness. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's close off this afternoon. We'll talk about the further development of behavior.